Paul Markle, uh, Interim Director, uh, Executive Director of the Barrie Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to thank uh, you for joining the Barrie Chamber today for our webinar. Um, reopening safely, uh, prepping your business before, but before we get started today, I'd like to uh, introduce, um, oh, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm reading the wrong script. <laughs> um, as more of our province opens up, and obviously with the, uh, the messaging we got this week with uh, um, the reopening for stage two on Friday, um, the possibility of contracting COVID-19 will remain a concern for employees. Um, we will need to continue to practice safe social distancing in space, uh, in a space that formerly had no restrictions. So today we'll be looking into what this landscape looks like for employees, what we know um, that we didn't know at the beginning of this pandemic, and what we can do as business owners and employers to ensure the safety of our teams. So before we begin the presentation, I'd like to let you know that after the presentation, we'll have a Q&A. Um, we may actually do some more Q&A, you know, during this one um, as, as it goes along, be a bit more interactive. So please submit questions using the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Um, and, uh, and we will read those questions as we, as we get them. If we can't get to all the questions, we'll try to respond to those um, after with emails, uh, but uh, we, we will get to all the questions. I'm happy to introduce first on sites, Jim Mandeville and Pensions jo uh, Jane, and I'm going to screw this up, Sinopoli. Um, who are our speakers today. Um, so I, with, that, with that out of the way, uh, please have at her. Uh, good morning. Um, my name is Jim. Uh, we are uh, Canada's largest restoration contractor, and we have been doing a lot of work throughout the pandemic, assisting businesses of you know, varying uh, types and sizes and, and orientations uh, continue to work throughout uh, the lockdown measures across Canada. Uh, this has been especially critical for, for those businesses who had to continue running, um, which is, I'm sure many of the people on the call can appreciate is a lot more than just purely healthcare. Um, there's a lot of pieces of machine that have to keep operating so that our society can function even in the limited capacity it has been. So um, I think we're here today mostly to talk about uh, some precautionary measures and what you, know, you as, uh, as business owners and operators uh, need to be thinking about uh, on the moving forward here as we progress into stage two in Ontario um, and some of the things that from an indoor air quality perspective you know Janet here can can talk about um, as well as uh, some reactive measures things you can do um, if uh, you know heaven forbid there is some sort of uh, confirmed case or problem at your business after you reopen um, as well as obviously some of the preventative things that uh, that can be done in advance and all the way along. So, um, I mean, Janet, if you want to talk about perhaps some of the, uh, you know, general concerns and, and IAQ things and, and housekeeping things that these guys can do to get started, that's probably the way to go, I think. Sure, absolutely. I'd be happy to. Uh, I'm Janet Sinopoli. I'm the operations manager for Pensions Barry Office. Pension is a large multinational er, firm, uh, and we've been thrown into the depth is uh, create reoccupancy plans as well as manage their current risk as it comes to reopening in today's uh, in today's world. Uh, luckily in Barrie we're now entering stage two of opening which means there's uh, opportunities for a lot of you possibly on this call to open your business which is great. Some of the things um, I'd just like to talk about that we've done at Pension and helped people with assisting them on getting back into their buildings. Um, we've worked diligently with First On Site, specifically in the GTA uh, and, and around uh, the, uh, the Barry area as well, doing um, cleaning of facilities. So kind of what that looks like is when you've had a presumed case or a confirmed case of COVID-19 at your workspace, uh, a contractor a qualified contractor would come in, such as first on site, they would clean and disinfect the facility with appropriate Health Canada um, virus to uh, all the test points of things that would be cleaned as a result of um, and then pinching within uh, we would assist the contractor by documenting the cleaning process that's occurring and then doing any testing afterwards to confirm that things are clean. So that's one aspect of the work that we've been helping out with businesses. The second aspect that we've been helping with is reoccupancy plans, because honestly, let's face it, we all want to get back into our buildings. So we've been working very diligently with businesses on trying to figure out how to 
put um, numbers of people uh, back into their spaces with limit uh, with a limited floor plan. So, for example, uh, six feet of distancing. Um, you know, figuring out how to occupy spaces, buildings, kitchens, boardrooms, uh, even um, spaces where tenants are located, hallways, uh, elevators of all things. Um, uh, quite elaborate plans is what we've been trying to work at. So uh, we've been um, working with a lot of Canada's top firms as well as local staff or local companies as well to make sure that everyone has an accurate plan um, to allow people to start coming back to work. Um, Jim, I'll, I'll throw that back over to you now. So I think um, an important thing is I start to see some questions come up here. Maybe we'll get into some fairly specific topics. Um, I think something that's interesting that a lot of a lot of people don't have a great grasp of is is the difference between cleaning and disinfecting and and really what's involved in disinfecting so the act of disinfection um, can only occur on a clean hard surface okay so when we come into a business a lot of businesses say that have a warehouse and that warehouse has got a lot of dust on it like many warehouses do on the pallet racking on the uh, shipping and receiving desk, you know, they're not necessarily the cleanest environments. Cardboard's not a great thing to deal with, you know. Um, the issue with that is that you can apply all of the strongest disinfectants on the market that are approved by Health Canada that'll kill COVID, that'll kill things much scarier than COVID, and it's not gonna do anything if that dust is still there. So the critical part to this, as you're looking at your cleaning procedures, like the health department's recommending, um, you know, there's a lot of increased cleaning that's going to be required in your businesses going forward is step one is everything needs to be clean first. So that means it needs to be clean with soap and water or a degreaser and water, depending on, you know, the type of business you're in. And of course that product needs to be properly handled and properly sourced for your business environment. So if you have a food grade facility, it needs to be a food grade cleaner. Uh, and then once it's clean, then you can apply the Health Canada approved disinfectant. Um, just because it says disinfectant on it and you bought it at Costco does not make it a disinfectant. Uh, it needs to have a DIN number on it, which is, I believe, an eight or nine digit number. Um, and it has to be approved by Health Canada. If you Google Health Canada approved disinfectants, there's a list right there from the federal government that lists all the products that are approved or recommended for, you know, virucidal disinfection or for this type of event. So. Um, I think that's an interesting thing. Um, I see some, uh, some, you know, definitely some topics here up around personal protective equipment. Um, being someone who's had to wear varying degrees, sometimes very intensive personal protective equipment my entire career, um, what I can tell you is that one of the most important things is using it appropriately and selecting it appropriately. So when we talk about things like face masks, um, definitely Health Canada has made some recommendations around cloth face coverings. Um, that's more so to prevent you spreading things to other people. Um, when we talk about protecting yourself or your employees from things, then, um, you know, we need to look more at what the hazards are, COVID, as well as other workplace hazards, because I'm sure lots of people, you know, have other things they're dealing with as well in the normal course of business. So. I think Janet, I mean, you can probably speak to the, you know, NIOSH recommendations and things like that probably better than I can, if you want to jump in on <laughs> sure. the PPE yeah. thing. Sure, no problem. So we've been, um, honestly, face coverings are the best way to protect the migration of droplets uh, into, for human interaction. We at Pension definitely recommend that people wear face masks as much as possible when physical distancing isn't possible. Uh, so just right along with what Health Canada is saying. We have been working diligently with our dental hygienists, our um, massage therapists, anyone who does a lot of physical contact. We've been doing a lot of fit testing for respirators, and those respirators are an N95 grade or better. But surgical masks, uh, cloth face coverings, anything like that are also acceptable as where um, uh, physical distancing isn't possible. Jim, did you so, want to try? Go ahead. Uh, just to add to that, I mean, Part of the consideration when selecting, you know, face covering or respiratory protection has got to be uh, what your environment is. Um, 
I'm sure everybody's worn a cloth face mask at this point. It's not the most comfortable thing in the world to wear long term. The same thing with a surgical mask. Um, if you've got staff that are going to need to wear something all day long um, because they're going to be in close contact, you may want to look at, you know, potentially upgrading to something a little bit more permanent. Um, bearing in mind that anything from an N95 grade or better or anything defined as a respirator is required to be, you know, professionally or from a certified standpoint, fit tested for each person. So just because you can buy it at Home Depot does not mean you can strap it on your employees and let them loose. Um, it's, it's, it's not okay with the, uh, you know, with the work safe people or anybody else. So I think that's important. Um, what were you saying, Janet, before I cut you off, unfortunately? <laughs> No, 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 that's fine. So um, you're right about that. N95 face masks are very specific. They are wonderful to use. They're very high quality, um, but they're only as good as the, um, the seal around them. So that's that seal that you get around your nose and around your mouth and underneath your chin. So fit testing those specific face masks are something we've been doing quite frequently for, especially for our healthcare providers. Um, but uh, like I said, I still want to err on the side of caution that face masks are definitely, definitely a fantastic tool to use when physical distancing isn't uh, possible. Um, so uh, along the same topic, you know, we see some, um, well, we can go back to uh, fit testing. So Janet, maybe you want to give the quick rundown on that. Yes, yeah, so fit testing is basically when you have somebody come and uh, test to make sure that your respirators are fitting the person properly. So you would uh, retain somebody to come in and do uh, fit testing. Fit testing is when we come in and we would use a, a hood and we would put the head over somebody who is wearing the fit, the, 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 while you have the rest, sorry, let me start again. You were, put the respirator on, we put a hood over your head. We would then inject a, uh, a bittersweet solution into the, into the hood. You would turn your head side side, up and down, we would get you to talk. As long as you can't taste that bittersweet solution in your mouth, then that's saying that you're not breathing in any of the contaminants around your head, which means that the, fit, that the respirator is fitted perfectly to your face. That's what fit test is. There we go. So on, you know, similar topic here about gloves. So um, mm -hmm. we've all worn gloves our whole life and uh, most of us are doing it wrong. Um, the gloves are only as good as how you treat them um, and how you don them and how you doff them or how you put them on and how you put them off. So um, gloves can protect you from just about anything, but if you are not very, very careful with how you take them off again, you're just going to get that contaminant on you again. Uh, so they can be very effective, but they're, they need to be changed very, very frequently. Um, you know, once those gloves have touched something that's potentially contaminated, now the gloves are contaminated. So before you touch your face or your arm or another, another doorknob or what have you, um, they would need to be changed again and properly removed, which is a little bit tough with a, a three-stage PowerPoint. <laughs> um, but uh, it, it can be helpful to wear them in certain situations, but certainly wearing the same pair of gloves all day uh, you know, in my opinion, if anything, it's probably more detrimental um, than not wearing them at all because it's it's going to lead you to not wash your hands as often as you probably should. So, so can you can you guys talk a little bit about the different kinds of uh, sanitizers, like hand sanitizers? You know, uh, at the chamber here, we picked up a, a gel type uh, oil based um, uh, de disinfectant that, that we're going to put on hard surfaces. But you've got the hand sanitizer and then hand washing as well. But I know that there's there's varying degrees of that. What should the, uh, you know, the, uh, the common business owner that's got people coming in and out be looking at to have um, sort of for use for employees and for customers as they, as they enter? Okay, so um, hand sanitizers are a fantastic way of obviously stopping the spread of anything uh, that's coming into your business. So we've seen a lot of businesses put hand sanitizers immediately on tables or at pump stations 
just before you're entering into a facility. I'm sure a lot of you have gone grocery shopping or to Canadian Tire or something like that lately, and every time you enter a space, you've noticed that you need to disinfect or hand sanitize your hands. Anything with a 70% alcohol base or higher is fantastic for sanitization. So um, it's something that you might want to consider that if you're having the public come in, your staff come in, um, that as they're walking into the building, they sanitize their hands. Uh, I think that's a fantastic way to obviously make sure that people are coming into the building and now have clean their hands, they're nice and clean, they're ready to go and they can, uh, and they're not going to be bringing anything into your facility, uh, potentially for on their hands. Jim, you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, certainly, you know, the hand sanitizer thing is crucial. Um, hand washing is crucial, much as the health department has has preached for 30 years now. Um, lots of us are still terrible at it. Lots of us are still not following their instructions for the full length of time and the, and the full procedure. So that's critical to reinforce with your employees and with your customers, depending on your, you know, the nature of your business. Um, when it comes to disinfectant specifically, uh, again, um, you're looking for something with a Health Canada DIN number. Um, there is a pretty extensive list on Health Canada's website of things that are approved. Um, also, what's critical, again, from someone who's worked with these products their whole life, is it's really important you read the instructions. Um, if it says 100 milliliters per four liters of water, they mean it. Um, if you use too much, it may not work right. If you don't use enough, it may not work right. So it's very and, critical you follow the instructions. And, and just to add to that too, Jim, thank you. It just reminded me of something, and sorry for cutting you off. These products are only as good as they're being used, and that's essential to what Jim was saying. A lot of these products have a contact time that the solution needs to stay in touch with something. So for example, it's not just a matter of putting something or spraying the, the disinfectant on a surface and then immediately wiping off. A lot of these uh, viricides require a 10 minute contact time. So you're spraying the uh, doorknob, let's say for example, with this viricide, you let it sit for 10 minutes and then if you need to, you go back, you spray it again and you wipe it clean. It's more or less the contact time because that's what's going to actually, um, uh, for lack of a better term, kill whatever could be potentially lurking on the surface. So, and, and along those same lines with disinfectants, a lot of what's out there right now uh, from an availability standpoint is not the easiest thing to work with from a personal protective equipment standpoint. So uh, we all know we have to wear this personal protective equipment for COVID, but we can't forget, you know, the basic women's regulations around chemical use. So you need to be reading the instructions on that, that viricide or disinfectant or degreaser, whatever you're using. Um, a lot of them are quaternary ammonia based, which can be very corrosive, especially if they're in a concentrated form. So, there's some very specific personal protective equipment that you need to wear just to handle that chemical. So that is an important consideration as a business owner um, in selecting what you're going to buy is uh, do my people have the appropriate training to use this chemical? Do I have the appropriate, you know, perhaps aprons or gloves or face shields required to use this chemical? Like that's it's something you need to think about rather than just, you know, buying it because the supplier said it's what he's got. Um, so definitely something to think about. So we, we have a, a, a list on our website and there's also the Ontario list of, a, a, you know, of suppliers, uh, you know, as the supply chain got weak. Um, we added that in just to make it uh, easier for, for our members, obviously, to find stuff locally. Um, but again, there's varying degrees of that. You know, the stuff that we've got is more commercial grade. It came pre-mixed. I, I know that there is a, a life cycle on that pre-mix as well. Um, you know, sanitizer, quad based ones, uh, I worked for McDonald's for a lot of years and, you know, that stuff was only be good for four hours and then it needed to be replaced. So you need to pay attention to that as well. You could be spraying something down um, that you think is uh, a good solution, but it's really just water. So, um, it, yeah, I, I think you're, uh, you're bang on there to make sure that you're uh, paying attention. Um, some of the other questions in here are surrounding, surrounding public washrooms um, and how do, you, how do you deal with people using them, cleaning uh, give, can you talk to any of the like frequency, that kind of thing, you know, small office versus your staff versus uh, a sort of a public space? Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, sorry, Jim, do you want to go ahead? No, I think it's this is probably something you're perfect for. Okay, so one of the questions was, are public washrooms high risk? Uh, what are your recommendations to avoid germs? So, um, 
Washrooms are just uh, as, as risky as anywhere else, I would say, at this stage in the game. People are washing their hands, people are using the washrooms, physical distancing is going to be required, is going to be absolutely mandatory. What we're seeing in office buildings that we're working with is we are advising our clients to um, limit the amount of people in your washrooms. So if you have um, if you have a stalled washroom, you know, no more than two people, in, uh, if possible, two people for in a washroom at a time and using occupancy signs, seeing whether or not they're in or out. And it's one of those things that you provide a on the door and allow staff to self-manage with physical distancing. Um, it's basically limiting people's two at a time it's to, you know, uh, wash their hands and then leave and, and not have to worry too much about uh, um, getting into contact with somebody. It, it's more, it's, it's obviously going to be about physical, dis or physical distancing. Also, uh, washing your hands in a washroom, obviously you're touching taps, you're touching things. I mean, it, it's difficult. I would, I would obviously, um, if what we're telling people is to use hand sanitizer as much as possible, open doorknobs, using paper towels if you can, just avoid trying to touch too many things. And then just again, keep doing washing your hands, keeping on top of your personal hygiene, making sure you're not touching your face, that type of thing. Um, and so that's kind of what I have to say about washrooms. Jim, do you want to, uh, from a physical distancing standpoint and an occupancy standpoint, do you have anything you want to talk about? Yeah, I mean, just from an operational standpoint, I mean, there's mm -hmm. a lot of good tips here on the Simcoe Muskoka um, Health Unit website as well. And, and really what this whole thing comes down to, especially if you have a public facing business or a business with a lot of office employees, is not dissimilar janitorial practices to what you had before, but way more frequently. Um, you know, if, if the bathroom used to get cleaned every night after work, now that thing probably needs to get cleaned two, three, four, five, six times a day, um, depending on how many people you've got flowing through there. And that's gonna be a business decision, uh, you know, in part based on each individual business's needs and, and occupancy loads. Um, and that goes for more than just a restroom. It's any, you know, commonly touched reception counters, doors and doorknobs and um, any high touch surfaces in the facility. Um, of course, you have to adjust your cleaning protocols to add in a disinfecting step, but at the same time, frequency is the key to this. Um, if you go back to cleaning things once a week like we did before, the chances of you having a problem are much, much greater. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's really a key point, I think. Mm, cool. So another question came in here in office, sir, our office has been closed for, for, for months. Can I assume when I come back in um, that it's safe of COVID if nobody's been in the space? So um, our recommendations and based on, you know, what Health Canada says and, and the WHO and various other, you know, national governing bodies is that um, generally speaking, the virus can last for a period of hours to days. Uh, depending on who you believe and which study you read. So generally speaking, if no one truly has been in there for months, the virus risk should be very low to, to none. Now, a lot of us think no one's been in our office. That's not necessarily the case. If you're in a large shared building, there have been security people, perhaps maintenance people, um, uh, some sort of cleaners. repair could have cleaners, ongoing janitorial staff, like there, there are a lot of people we don't normally consider who have remained working in these buildings to keep them alive through the, you know, through the, the whole lockdown thing. So, right. um, so that's definitely a consideration. Uh, and then just because the, the, potentially if you are a standalone facility and no one truly has been in there and the virus risk is, is low to nil, uh, there's still other sort of indoor air quality um, and general cleanliness and, and other hazards that could now be present because our buildings are not designed to be dormant for this long. Yeah. Um, so there's definitely some other things that can be considered. And I know pension has been working uh, with a lot of businesses, you know, a part of the reoccupancy plan on that topic as well. Yes, we have been. We've been working with a lot of facilities specifically as it relates to their HVAC unit. Everybody wants to make sure that the air that they're providing to their businesses, to their spaces, to their tenants is safe for them to be safe for them to have. 
So a lot of units have, or a lot of building uh, property managers have been upgrading their um, filters on their HVAC systems. They've been switching to a MERV 13 filter or higher. Uh, this basically is to prevent any airborne particulate uh, of, of a small scale size um, in micrometers to enter spaces. So they're basically cleaning out, uh, keeping the air quality clean from particulate as well as uh, any other matter that could potentially be coming into the HVAC unit. We have always told people not to open windows in businesses. We feel like the air you're getting from your HVAC unit is going to be a lot cleaner than the air that you'd be getting from outside a window or from opening a door. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't fly on, uh, I'm sorry, I just got something that interrupted me. Um, we wouldn't necessarily recommend that you would open windows. You would be, depending on your HVAC unit, to providing you with fresh air. One thing we've been doing for our clients as well is when they have, they have decided to take on the added expense of increasing their HVAC maintenance, the, um, upgrading their filters. We've been doing proactive indoor air quality testing to confirm that the air that they're providing to their tenants, to their businesses, et cetera, is acceptable. Um, we've been getting a lot of requests to do that specifically. It's more to give people in a, a, a level of comfort that the air that they're going to be breathing inside a building is safe post-COVID or COVID related. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, so another, so that's, we've covered off a couple of questions that are in here. One of them is, and, and sort of, I'm jumping back and forth a bit, but is uh, how long does the virus typically sit on a non-porous surface? Um, yeah, I've, I've, you know, I've heard varying ideas of that as well. So it's, I'm kind of curious as well. Uh, certainly uh, what we've been discussing with our customers is that um, there's a study out of Germany that suggests on room temperature plastics and other, you know, common hard surfaces that it could last for a period of three to six days. Um, there are other studies out of the United States that suggest it is, um, you know, sort of in the, in the one to three days. And then there are other studies out there that, uh, you know, say sort of four to 24 hours. Now, there's a lot of things that go into that um, that are really difficult to measure, which is why the, you know, this real science is all over the place. So everything from, you know, the surface that the caps had sitting on to the um, background dust and, and particulate that's there to the temperature and ambient humidity in the room to the UV light exposure, the, the variables are innumerable. So mm -hmm. it, it's not something you know, that we're willing to put a, uh, you know, at 23 and a half hours, you're safe limit on. Um, and we always urge, you know, especially business owners to err on the side of caution because of the potential liability exposure. So uh, certainly if no one truly has been in a space for months, we've not seen any science to suggest something could last that long and almost anything could last that long. Um, but if it's a day or two or, you know, once we reopen here and, you know, you find out that yesterday uh, there was a person in your facility who has now tested positive, uh, that's a real problem that we think from a liability perspective and health and safety perspective, you need to address and address quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, are there any resources that you guys, I mean, obviously you're, you're developing these plans, but where do you go to find your information? Um, you know, have you found something that's particularly valuable uh, that's commonly available um, on the on the provincial or uh, federal websites. Um, have you got any uh, tips along those lines as far as an individual business developing a plan other than phoning you guys for, for some professional help? <laughs> uh, there are a lot of great plans out there. Um, the uh, GTA has put out a, the city of Toronto has actually put out a reoccupancy plan based on high-rise buildings. Um, I know that the AIHA, uh, BOMA, IFMA, a lot of property management firms have also put out reoccupancy plans with really great information. Um, they're very, they're more generic, whereas uh, we're finding, um, you know, some of our, our other clients are looking for more specific to their individual spaces information out there that really is useful. It's just depending on uh, whether you feel like you need some help or uh, if you can manage it on your own. One other thing we've been helping too is as people are developing their plans, we've been allowing people to um, uh, send us their plans and we've reviewed them for them and given our opinion as necessary, which, which has been great in helping people uh, make informed decisions about reoccupying their spaces. Yeah, yeah. I would suggest that any business that has a high amount of traffic really needs to be looking for some professional help 
in developing these um, the smaller solopreneurs. Um, you know, that may may have a, a smaller storefront where they don't have a lot of uh, um, uh, you know, traffic. You know, they may need to address it a bit differently. But there is a cost for all these things, and we've got cash drop businesses. So, um, you know, anything that's uh, um, that's ready and and, uh, and inexpensive is is a good idea. But uh, and one of the reasons why we're doing these webinars as well is to help people get a better idea of what they can do to help themselves. I've got a question here about the uh, uh, MERV 13 uh, mm -hmm. filters and, and do they restrict airflow? Um, so, so that's actually, a, yeah, I see that as well. Uh, the question is, doesn't the MERV 13 restrict or filter restrict airflow and possibly strain the equipment? That's a really great question and it's actually true. The MERV 13 is a great filter, however, it could potentially restrict airflow. It's very important that people understand the filters that they're putting into their HVAC equipment be uh, investigated first if whether or not your equipment can even handle a MERV 13. If it can't, there are other alternatives as well. MERV uh, 7, 8, and 9 are also other fantastic filters as well. So if you can't handle a 13, potentially you can handle something a little bit of a lesser quality, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not protecting your staff. It just means that your equipment can only handle so much. Therefore, do the maximum of what you can is what we're basically recommending. Okay, that's, yeah, that's good to know. It, it's critical on that point that you consult an HVAC professional. Um, Absolutely. You know, I'm, I've been in construction and restoration my entire life. I'm not going to pretend to tell you exactly which filter you need in your building. Um, you need to you need to consult a professional um, and make sure that that system's designed for the right filter because you can cause you know irreparable damage to your rooftop units or your or your HVAC unit um, by over filtering them. Um, so it's that's definitely something you need to investigate before you just go out and buy a filter. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And by no means am I saying everybody run out and get a MERV 13. It's look at your, of what your, what your system can potentially handle with the help of your HVAC people to assist you to make the right decisions. So um, absolutely. That's my recommendation. Well, we, we may have lost Jim there for a second. Uh, oh, there he is. No, he's back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry about that. That was, uh, I know you're, you're up in Fort Mac or something, are you not? Uh, yeah, I'm managing our response to the overland flooding they had here in Fort Mac. So I've been here since late April, um, wow. which is part of my job. Actually, I live in Aurelia, but I haven't been, uh, I have not been back there since late April. So looking forward to it. Hopefully I'll be back in July. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we're about a half an hour in. We got a few more minutes before we, we get to sort of close up. Um, so we'll get to a few more of these questions. We've got um, two questions. I'll, I'll sort of uh, uh, bundle them together from one of our members. Um, are floor markings required in a store to ensure social distancing? Um, and on top of that one, um, how many people are permitted to be in a store at one time? So I'm not sh sure. I, I know that that stuff is readily available. I'm not sure if all of that has been released by the province yet, but uh, from a capacity standpoint inside of a inside of a building but uh can either of you guys speak to that i mean obviously we're not the province right um and i my understanding is ontario has not released regulations that are that specific yet uh what they have said is reduced capacity what i can tell you about some other provinces that are a little bit further along specifically alberta and british columbia is that they're recommending no more than 50 percent of capacity or rated capacity in a facility uh, from a retail perspective, so things like grocery stores or convenience stores or what have you, um, even clothing stores are recommending no more than 50% capacity to be able to maintain social distancing. Um, and as far as markings on the floor go, to my knowledge, the province hasn't said that yet, but I think it's just good common practice to be able to help your customers, um, you know, and, and give them a bit of advice and say, hey, this is, this is how, this is, you know, how far apart you need to stand. It, you know, you can ask, you can ask 10 people on the street how far two meters is. And I almost guarantee you, not a one of them will know exactly how far two meters is. So um, if you're concerned about that and you want to help your customers, I think it's a great idea. It's very low cost. I mean, you just need a roll of tape, right? Yep. Yep. In a lot of ways. So a question here again from another member, um, what would the, the cleaning procedure be in an office that does have a case of COVID? Do we need to bring in a company to clean or can we it ourselves. So I think we've sort of answered this um, in, through the through the discussion, but maybe just specifically, uh, what are your opinions on that? I know you're going to tell them to come and see you, um, but is this something that you would recommend that they handle on their own? Uh, 
I mean, I'm, I'm not even going to say that, to be honest with you. I mean, what I'm going to say is that um, the cleaning itself is not, it needs to be very, very detailed. Um, and, and people need to have training and experience in very detailed cleaning, um, generally a step above standard janitorial. And, and whomever you hire or train or what have you to do this, the most important part is that they're wearing the appropriate personal protective equipment and that they're very good and experienced at taking that equipment on and off. Um, we've had hundreds of people across the country doing this decontamination work for months now and have been fortunate enough that none of them have gotten sick. But we've also invested a tremendous amount of time and, and money and effort in training our people to properly don and doff their equipment. Um, there's a lot of studies out there, even in medical environments, where the medical professionals most often are likely to get infected when they're taking their personal protective equipment off. Um, so the, that's really a large part of the skill set that gets overlooked. Um, the other thing is that I would caution, you know, if you've got a confirmed case or suspected case in your business, is you get what you pay for. Um, if you've got somebody who had a sign on a telephone pole in your neighborhood who can come and do it for 300 bucks, you're going to get 300 bucks worth. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's the only thing I would caution. There, there are many competent, trained, experienced firms out there. Um, certainly we're one of them, but there, there are many, many options and different price points and extents to which one can go to because, uh, again, the science on this stuff is a little bit open-ended still and, and open right. to interpretation. So. And let me just add to that too. What we've been seeing is we've had a lot of people say, well, we have a cleaning company that regularly cleans our business. Are they good enough to clean our facility? So what we've been asking people to do is to have your cleaning staff um, submit their cleaning procedures or uh, to, to specifically deal with a case like this. A lot of companies will have what's called an enhanced cleaning procedure that they're using to uh, you know, do further cleaning on spaces uh, below the two meter mark, uh, frequent touch points, trying to increase, you could ask them for what products they're using. So if the protocol that they're submitting to you is acceptable and you feel that that's fine for your business, then all by all means. But if you feel like the cleaning procedures that they've submitted to you isn't satisfactory, then people like First On Site are a great alternative to start doing this cleaning uh, for you so that you can protect your staff, the public, et cetera. Yeah, and I, and I would add just from a, you know, a, a past business owner standpoint, I think the liability that you take on by not getting it done properly um, can be very detrimental in the, in the long run, um, more specifically because you're not protecting your most valuable asset, your people um, and your customers. So uh, that, that would be something that uh, I, I would certainly sort of be leaning towards. Um, you're not an expert uh, in cleaning unless you're a cleaning business and uh, leave that up to the professionals to take care of things. Exactly. And if you're not comfortable with the procedures that are provided to you by your cleaning company, then by all means, outsource it. Because the last thing you want is somebody to say that they've contracted COVID-19 from your facility or close contact by something like that. So you just want to be able to protect yourself the saying that you've done everything you can to protect your staff and, your, and the public. Um, so my, my job requires me to visit other businesses. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend I do to protect myself and the businesses I'm visiting? I think that's relatively a standard with the, you know, maybe wearing a mask and gloves and, you know, not touching your face. So I think that would be more the general, uh, the general uh, procedure. Yeah. And you, and also to your business should probably have created like a field guide or some kind of pro, uh, some sort of direction on what you should be doing when you are entering other people's businesses. I know that mm, some other businesses also too, if they are having outside contractors come in, they're asking you to sign a COVID-19 waiver, saying whether like asking you if you're feeling sick or, or et cetera. So um, I, again, same things, physical distancing, proper hand washing, wearing face clothes, wearing a mask, whatever you feel comfortable is doing, and then follow the procedures your company has outlined for you as you're seeing other, as you're going to other sites. Perfect, okay. Um, how, how far do we need to go in collecting, and this is another question from the field, uh, in collecting data for possible contact tracing if required? Should we be asking for addresses, phone numbers, email addresses? Is that our responsibility uh, to reach out if we have an outbreak or does the health uh, unit take care of that? Um, first of all, I'm not an attorney, uh, but personal information, as we all know, is a very sensitive topic in this day and age, and the, the Privacy Act in Canada is pretty stringent. 
Um, so I would be very careful about additional information collection and, and what you're doing with that and how you're doing that. The same as you would, you know, everyone's trying to collect as much data as possible on their customers already. Um, that definitely is a public health responsibility contact tracing. They're, they're going to want as much information as you can give them. Um, but that's really more of a, a public health question than, or perhaps even for your general counsel. Yeah. I agree. One, of, one of the things we're doing at the chambers, we have a sign in and out sheet, right? So um, we have a very limited number of people coming in and out, but uh, they sign in, sign out. That way we know at least who's been in the building. Um, but that's about as far as I think we're going to go in terms of collecting information. Um, for the most part, it's just going to be the same staff, um, uh, but at least it gives you a time frame as to when they were in the building. Um, it's, and it's generally a good practice anyways for any business from a, a security standpoint. But uh, yeah, good question though. Um, another one here, what other environmental items should be aware of for buildings that have been not occupied in for a few months? So I guess that would be environmental hazards. Like what other hazards could be potentially there that should be considered? I know like carpet off gases, that kind of thing. Is there, you know, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm spitballing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. There's lots of things that can happen in a building when they haven't been vacated or when they've been vacated for, uh, you know, so many months. You could have had <clears throat> roof leaks or toilet backups or any type of water infiltration. That's obviously an issue. Um, you could have rodents or mice or infestations of that kind of thing. These are all things to keep an eye out for. Um, HVAC, obviously your HVAC might have been off or on, so you want to make sure that your HVAC units are testing. We're coming into the heating or coming into a, a pretty hot summer from what I'm gathering. Making sure the relative humidity is ideal for your space so that you're not creating environments or uh, dealing with any potential mold issues as you go forward as a result of uh, humidity. Um, doing a thorough look around your facilities, looking for anything potentially like garbage and sitting around, any kind of hazards that potentially could be uh, a result of, of a vacant building. Um, Jim, you might have had a little bit more hands-on than this. Have you seen any? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, because of the nature of my, my job and what I do, I deal with a lot of buildings that have been a vacant for months. I follow catastrophes around the continent. So, um, oftentimes one thing that really gets overlooked is when buildings have been empty for a long time, especially, um, you know, multi-unit residential and food businesses is that when your drains haven't been used for several months, all of the stuff that's in there uh, that collects on the sides of the drain pipes goes hard like concrete. And then you start using the drains again like crazy and the drains back up and you have a sewer back up. So it's really important for the first few days or the first week, especially, you know, restaurateurs, uh, other sort of food processing, any food grade, if you've been shut down for a long period of time, they really keep a really close eye on those drains and make sure they're draining you know, at the speed they always were um, and that things aren't starting to back up. Most of the time uh, when you have these, you know, dried out drains that cause these backups, it's, it is apparent from the beginning if you're used to the building, you know, that the drains will run slower, they'll bubble, they'll gurgle, they'll, something will be strange. And if you stop at that point when it's strange and get a drain contractor in there to snake them all out and, and clean them all out, you'll be fine. It'll just cost you a few hundred dollars to have the pipe snaked out. If you ignore it and keep running water through it, then it's potentially a really, really big mess in your business. So um, definitely keep an eye on the drains, uh, you know, especially for the first few days. And also when you first get back in the building, you know, so along the lines of what Janet was saying about, you know, water infiltration is that things that, you know, normally it's like, oh yeah, that sink drips. Well, that sink's been dripping for two months while you weren't there. Um, it could be growing stuff now um, because usually it gets mopped up every day or, you know, you clean underneath that water fountain every day when you're normally there. And now that you haven't been there for two months, it could be a real problem. So when you first get back in there, perhaps before the rest of your employees do, you need to have a really thorough look around, um, you know, bottoms of walls, tops of walls, the ceiling, things you don't normally look at every day and just make sure there's nothing that stands out and goes, Oh, this is, this is a problem. Yeah. One of the things that we had, I mean, uh, was just the, the HVAC. Um, you know, the building hadn't been open for a while. We came in and it was, you know, it was an oven. So it's going to take a couple of days to get your temperatures down and make sure that that equipment's working properly where it may have been serviced. Uh, it, it may not have been serviced you know, properly for the for re reopening into the cooling season. And, and the last one, which is important, is the science ex experiment that happens in your fridges. Um, 
I, I came in and, uh, and, and got rid of some stuff in our fridge that had been uh, growing um, in different directions for, for a month or two. So, yeah, I, that's, but that, uh, that drain thing, that's a, that's a great tip. You know, I mean, uh, not something you would think about for sure. Um, yeah, it, it's something we see in towns that have been evacuated, um, you know, for extended periods of time and people come back and if a yeah. massive sewer backup so yeah. yeah it's it's something to pay attention to because that's a real rude awakening yeah and it can be one of those things that's not covered by your your insurance policy either right so that can uh, be a concern you that kind of coverage you're, you could be in real trouble for for sure um should companies implement a COVID 19 waiver for employees i have a friend who has uh, to sign off on a questionnaire every monday Uh, I, I mean, again, this is a, a pretty HR oriented question. Um, what I can tell you is that um, we do regularly have our employees sign off saying that, you know, are you feeling unwell? Do you have a cough? Have you? Um, now, we do that because we're a lot more of a high risk business um, than perhaps your neighborhood shoe store or, you know, what have you. Um, but definitely that's something that you're going to want to consult with you know, your HR partner, consultant, or your, especially, uh, you know, in unionized environments with your, you know, with your, your labor contacts, right? Okay. Um, questions here about training staff on new cleaning and disinfecting procedures. Uh, you know, do you have recommendations for training staff on new cleaning and, and disinfecting uh, procedures? Um, definitely do it. <laughs> um, and definitely follow the manufacturer's instructions. Again, I, I can't say it enough times. I love to throw instructions away on things when I buy them when they're brand new, but when it comes down to, uh, you know, your people being your most important asset and, and protecting your business, which is, you know, oftentimes your, you know, your, your life's work. Um, it's really important you follow the rules and follow the instructions and really make sure your people understand um, the procedures and everything. There are, you know, a pension's a great resource. There are other resources out there from a policy perspective. Um, and there are definitely some great online guides um, from the chemical manufacturers and the, and the product providers. So if you look up the manufacturer, or the cleaning chemicals you're buying, a lot of them have tutorials out there. Um, there are trade associations out there, you know, in the janitorial field that have great resources. The um, IICRC, which is a um, governing body, guideline providing body for the cleaning and restoration industry, uh, has some great uh, general info on their website as well as much more in-depth training and certifications available. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of training everybody on, on you know, everything you can train them on every chance you get. Um, so definitely that's something that, uh, that you want to look into. Okay, we'll try to get some of that information from you guys, uh, you know, as the uh, at the end of this and we can have that uh, you know on our website and as a resource for uh, for everybody that's watching um, I, I, those aren't sites that we would normally go to but I think uh, you know it's, it's very relevant to um, uh, to our, our topic today so we get a question in here from uh, one of our members about Health Canada recommending signage for restaurateurs to indicate to the public that they've cleaned their restaurant um, I'm not sure that that's a question that our, our panelists can answer but I would say that most, in most cases, the, your restaurants are regulated by the local health department. Um, and I would, uh, I would look to, to them to see if they've got anything that's pre-produced. Pre but, uh, you know, obviously putting signage up, notifying your, uh, your patrons that, uh, that your restaurant's been professionally cleaned or cleaned or, or sanitized, de disinfected, uh, is always a good practice. I think more communication about that, uh, the better. So uh, it, provided you've actually done the cleaning. Um, but uh, I, I would go to the local health department for that info. Um, and you, obviously, if you want to call the chamber, we can, uh, we can help you to maybe navigate that as well with the, you know, through the staff here. Um, are daily temperature checks necessary in an average workplace for staff and visitors? HR related, more again? Or? <laughs> HR related, but I mean, from, again, from a, from a basic science standpoint, um, it's not super effective. Um, especially with the equipment that's commercially available to you from Canadian Tire. A yeah. lot of those things are plus or minus three or four degrees Fahrenheit. Right. That's not going to tell you anything. Um, mm -hmm. 
there's definitely some, you know, some higher end equipment out there that can give you a lot more accurate readings and, and that stuff's a little bit more relevant in the healthcare field. But yeah, yeah I would, I would be hesitant to, uh, to wager my business on a, on a digital thermometer from Canadian Tire. Yeah. I, I mean, we do have a, you know, we have a listing on our, on our website for, um, uh, companies that are, you know, in, in our area that supply that stuff. Um, yeah. and, and those, you know, those things that they're supplying are, are, you know, perhaps the, better than the grade that you're going to get at Canadian Tire. Um, sure. Generally, testing your engine is a little different than testing a forehead. Exactly. Um, but finding PPE for your business, again, you know, there's a provincial site that, uh, that has a, a lot of listings in there. And then, again, we've got our listing on, on our local chamber um, for, for the companies that are around. And, and that list is continuing to expand as um, some of our businesses take on, you know, and, and pivot into, into the PPA market, PPE market. So um it's all readily available i think you just got to do a little bit of dig digging um other questions in here i don't think we necessarily need to we've sort of touched on them for the most part in here and i'm not seeing a lot of new ones coming in um i think you know based on time we are about 15 minutes in maybe we can just wrap it up if you guys got any closing statements and then uh i'll, I'll do my my exit and we'll go from there but i again thank you for your uh, your time today it's been very informative uh, Janet, do you have anything you'd like to say in, clo in closing? Um, yeah, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to all of you guys today. If anyone has any reoccupancy plans or any questions about reoccupying your buildings that you'd like to further uh, run by me, you're more than welcome to reach out. Um, if you do have any, uh, any confirmed cases of COVID-19 and you're worried about, um, you know, re-entering your spaces and you want to talk about cleaning methods or talking about testing or anything like that, please feel free to reach out. We're definitely here to assist and help with anything uh, along those lines. Um, HVAC related, obviously talk to your HVAC providers when it comes to upgrading your filters. But if you're interested in looking at doing some indoor air quality testing prior to reoccupancy, again, please feel free to reach out. We're, we're diligently working on this on a daily basis. Good stuff. Thank you. And Jim, it, uh, any finishing statements from you? Uh, yeah, again, thanks for the opportunity to talk to everybody. It's, uh, it's greatly appreciated. It's a nice break from what I've been dealing with here lately. So, um, and I guess really, you know, my parting thoughts for everybody is, uh, you know, if you used to clean it once a week, start cleaning it three times a day, especially if it's public facing or you got a lot of employees. Um, and if you used to take 10 seconds to clean it, start taking five times as long. Um, that's really the key to this whole thing is clean, 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 clean it. And, and on top of that, just, uh, you know, protect your employees and don't just throw jugs of chemicals out and make sure you read the instructions. So, and, uh, if you've got a confirmed case or something that, you know, is intimidating to you or, uh, something you're not comfortable having your, you know, your people deal with and definitely, uh, look for a qualified, experienced firm that can that can help you with that cleaning. Not the you know, not something off a flyer on a telephone pole. Yep. So yeah, I, uh, it's great advice. And, and again, uh, you know, it's, this is not the time to be cutting corners. You know, um, if, if you want to reopen and stay reopen, if we all do this properly, um, we're all going to be in a better position. And when I say all, we not you know all all members when we cut corners, uh, it, it shortens the uh, um, you know our longevity really with the um, getting to the next stages and getting back to something that's more normal. So thank you again for, uh, for coming today. Um, in closing, um, I'd like to thank, thank you for joining us in the work that you're doing in your business every day. We urge every leader in our community to maintain their focus on showing the pace of, uh, slowing the pace of transmission of COVID-19, whatever stage of operations their business may be currently in. Barry Chamber is here to help you through this. Please feel free uh, to email us or call us. Uh, the office is slowly reopening. I'm in here every single day. Um, and we can connect you with the right resources uh, every single time. Uh, we implore everyone to please shop local. We need more, um, uh, we need more now than ever to support our local businesses, uh, whether it's uh, takeout from, uh, from a restaurant or gift certificates to help businesses right out the storm. Maybe it's a, a larger company that has a local presence that are employing uh, you know, local employees. You know, it's free off of Amazon as much as you can buy local. Um, and again, as our province takes steps towards reopening, please ensure that you continue to follow social distancing requirements and the rules as they come out uh, and take them seriously. The safety of our community is the responsibility of all of us uh, collectively. So again, thank you very much for your time today. We'll post your information up on our, uh, on our website. Uh, this video will be uh, available on Facebook um, and very shortly once it gets uh, sort of all finished up. And then uh, we also have uh, these all on our YouTube channel as well. So. 
Um, if you haven't subscribed to our to the Chamber's YouTube channel, I would suggest that you do that. There's lots of great resources there from now and things that we've done in the past. Um, and this content will stay there as long as needed. So again, thanks very much. Have a safe day and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good stuff.